So tonight we have come from across the country and around the world to share a very historic moment, the opening night of our 125th Continental Congress. For a century and a quarter, daughters have gathered to report on the business of our society, to document those achievements that fulfill our enduring mission to promote historic preservation, education, and patriotism. Our anniversary provides a special moment to reflect on what we have accomplished in these 125 years of service to America. But of course, no celebration would be complete without special guests. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with a great deal of pride and not an insignificant amount of surprise myself that I welcome to the platform the woman who opened our very first Continental Congress in February 1892. Please greet First Lady and First President General Caroline Scott Harrison. Good evening, Madam President General. Thank you for inviting me to this most auspicious occasion. My, this is quite a grand hall and quite a sophisticated audience. We are delighted to welcome you. And may I say, you look lovelier than ever, Mrs. Harrison. Why, <laughs> not a day over 183. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking quite well yourself this evening. In fact, if you represent today's DAR, I'm confident we're accomplishing wonderful things. 125 years? My goodness. And I understand you're the 43rd President General and you're here all the way from the great state of Texas? We know where your fans are. <laughs> That's quite a train ride. I've taken that train ride myself. <laughs> but tell me, in all seriousness, do we now allow cowboy hats to be worn with insignia? Ah. Well, <laughs> not yet, but I do still have a few more days left in office. <laughs> I believe, Mrs. Harrison, you would be quite pleased to know that DAR has evolved to meet the needs of modern women while retaining many of the thoughtful courtesies of your time. But most important, we have remained true to our mission. We have never wavered in fulfilling the founder's visionary call to service or in our devotion to promoting the rights and responsibilities of American citizenship. Oh, how grateful I feel to be here this evening to celebrate all the accomplishments over the decades. Please tell me more, in fact, as I am able to be here this evening, might we not also meet some of these women, hear some of their stories, and learn how they served America? I hoped you would ask that. <laughs> Please make yourself comfortable, Mrs. Harrison. And let me introduce you to a small representation of the nearly one million women who have spent the last 125 years serving God, home, and country. While these members are selected at random to join us this evening to illustrate the breadth of the work in our chapters and states, large and small, we hope they will demonstrate the continuum of our service work that stretches from 1890 until today. Just a few short years after our founding, DAR answered the call to service when the Army Surgeon General called upon our society to act as a review board for female nurses to care for the wounded soldiers fighting the Spanish-American War. The DAR Hospital Corps Committee, led by our own Dr. Anita Newcomb McGee, to ultimately certified 1,081 nurses. These women served aboard the hospital ship Relief in Puerto Rico, Cuba, the Philippines, Hawaii, and China and Japan, as well as in stateside detention camps that housed returning soldiers. Among the nurses was Rubina Hyde Walworth, daughter of our founder, Ellen Harden Walworth. With no brothers available to enter the fight, I felt it my duty to answer the call to care for our boys. I was assigned at Camp Wyckoff on the eastern point of Long Island at Montauk, because of course the doctors knew the northerly winds would carry the typhoid and yellow fevers out to sea. In time, nearly 30,000 men would be brought to our camp, 
as many as 10,000 at a time, all in one overcrowded tent city. The conditions were deplorable. We did not have enough food, clothing, medicine. One newspaper headline read, starving men at Montauk. Another said, it is murder being done at Montauk. We did our best to care for these boys. We were grateful to the DAR chapters that sent blankets, shirts, boots. We did our best. Nothing at Vassar prepared me for measles, malaria, diphtheria, suffering. We did our best. I did my best. The medical staff totaled more than 500 at Camp Wyckoff, and only one died as a result of camp conditions there. Rubina Hyde Walworth, whom we lost to yellow fever in October 1898. At just 31 years of old, she died in service to her nation and to our society. How tragic she was, her mother's constant companion. How devastating for our dear Ellen. Pray, please tell me more about these early daughters and what they achieved. In the first decade of that new century, daughters in communities of every size set about collecting all sorts of vital records and items. They took seriously the charge to preserve thousands of local sites of historic significance, including the graves of their own patriot ancestors. As they worked to perpetuate the memory and spirit of the men and women who achieved American independence, they discovered in their midst a living connection to the American Revolution, real daughters. DAR members whose fathers had fought in the war. These women were treasured. Many received DAR pensions, which were oftentimes their only support in old age. One of the last two surviving real daughters was Caroline Randall. I felt honored when I was asked to join the Samuel Ashley chapter in Claremont, New Hampshire, not only for myself, but for my father, Stephen Hassam. He was born in Boston in 1761, and he witnessed the Battle of Bunker Hill. Believe it or not, he lived to be 100. Well, I guess that's not too hard to believe because I was born when he was 88. <laughs> yes, he was quite a man. <laughs> He died when I was 12. Yes, that is me. I do want to thank the kind daughters for the support I have received. As I wrote recently, my pension I received from the DAR Society provides for all of my necessities at present, and I am very comfortably placed. In my later years, the ladies in my chapter have visited me, brought me gifts, and in fact, taken care of all my needs. Yes, I am grateful for all that the daughters have done to honor my father's service by assisting me. How generous these daughters were so cared for, untouched by their daughter's suffering. The daughters' generosity, courage, and patriotism were to shine brightly through the clouds that gathered over Europe in the decade that followed while 262 daughters answered the call to serve as nurses during World War I, virtually every member played some role in the war relief effort. They knitted more than half a million garments, donated 20 ambulances, provided 205,000 comfort kits, and nearly 2 million surgical supplies. They led Red Cross efforts and rolled bandages. They bought war bonds, and they sent their husbands and sons over there. The National Society adopted the project to rebuild the water system in Tullaroy, France, and then the daughters stepped forward to care for the French orphans of war. Elizabeth Barney Buell served as a Connecticut state regent from 1909 until 1922. When the DAR War Relief Service Committee took up the cause of the French orphans, Connecticut daughters stepped forward to do our share. During 1918, the goal was to give 10 cents per child or $36.50 per year to support each orphan. 
the National Society worked through the French ambassador to support approximately 700 orphans in France. I am proud to say that 22 of our chapters adopted 45 orphans. Connecticut members committed to help another 172 children for a yearly effort of nearly $8,000, some 217 children in all. It was one way that we could make a meaningful difference, and it allowed us to honor the memories of the French soldiers who had helped us win our own freedom. We also hoped to restore these children's faith in humanity. They were all too young to witness the war to end all wars. For the noble works our daughters have accomplished, we had hoped and we had dreamed, but I don't think we ever imagined what could be accomplished when women organized in such a way. What's next, a woman running for president? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think you would be quite surprised to know what, <laughs> what interesting developments have occurred in presidential politics. I will fill you in later. <laughs> I'd rather tell you about the amazing work that our daughters accomplished to welcome new citizens something we've done ever since the first Americanism Committee was established in 1919. The next year, we began printing our DAR Manual for Citizenship, of which nearly 10 million copies were distributed in the first 50 years, a time of great immigration to this country. In 1921, Continental Congress authorized a resolution to seek better services for women and children being detained on Ellis Island. Blanche Perkins served as the national chair of our Ellis Island Committee in, two, in the 1920s. We are the first non-governmental Americans these detained immigrants encountered. So you might say we're the first smiling faces that welcome them to our nation. In the early years, we worked exclusively with women, giving them materials to make into garments for their families. The program was so successful, the government asked us to do the same thing for men who made shirts, trousers, and other items while detained, sometimes kept with us for days, often weeks. We are grateful to the chapters across the country who support our work by providing five cents a year per capita to fund salaries for our two matrons and to the many daughters who send scraps and bolts of material to support the program. Who can tell? what valuable citizens of the future may be among those we are caring for today. Stop and consider those of foreign birth who have helped to make America great. Our efforts surely will not be in vain. During the 1930s, the DAR struggled through the Great Depression along with the rest of this nation. Our membership roster declined as families struggled to make ends meet. But our flame was never extinguished and our work continued. Some of it was focused on protecting the American landscape through the work of the Conservation Committee. Chapters raised funds to plant millions of trees in cooperation with the Civilian Conservation Corps and the United States Forestry Service, replacing some of the millions of acres of timberland that had been lost to wildfires and harvesting. National Chair of the Conservation Committee, Mrs. Avery Turner, reported on the need for and the success of the Penny Pines program in 1938. Did you know that more than 41 million acres of our forests burned last year, estimated at 60 million in timber damages, in addition to the losses of watershed, recreation, and scenery? Our society can be a great force in reconstructing America's forests. Michigan leads all other states through the planting of 155 million seedlings and the dedication of the world's largest tree nursery. The U.S. Forestry Service has recently announced the establishment of two memorial forests by our society under the Penny Pines program. States need only work with the Forest Service to select a location up to 1,000 acres. The government will provide the site, supervisor, and seedlings, which will be planted 1,000 to an acre for every $4 contributed. 
Our goal is to sponsor at least one DAR memorial forest in each state, living monuments for all time, reminders of our nation's precious natural heritage and our devotion to it. I wonder if our four founders, as visionary as they were, could have ever imagined what could have been accomplished. And dare I wonder if America itself may well have been a very different place indeed had it not been for the women of the DAR. Indeed, and yet it might be said that the finest hours came during World War II when our society turned over the use of these national headquarters to support the war effort including the Red Cross and government agencies such as the Prisoners of War Department. Across the nation, daughters amassed war stamps, war bonds and stamps. They adopted projects as just two examples among thousands. A war service center in New York's Roosevelt Hotel that was staffed six days a week by local daughters, and ultimately the sponsorship of 82 landing craft infantry ships of the U.S. Navy. Equipment, supplies, blood plasma, quite literally, blood, sweat, and tears. These were the daughters' contributions to American victory. No community was spared from sacrifice in some form or other, and daughters from every state, east, west, large, small, rural, and urban, gave of themselves. Consider the Wyoming daughters, as reported by their state regent, Georgia Omar, in 1945. Wyoming daughters erected a memorial at Thermopolis. It contained 23 trees, one for each Wyoming man killed in action and each bearing a plaque with his name. One chapter erect, adopted a ward of 44 patients at the Veterans Hospital. Many serving were Wyoming Indians and our daughters took special care to assist them. We sponsored Landing Craft Infantry number 554 and recently, a sailor was transferred from the LCI to the U.S. Wyoming. He wrote to express his pleasure at being assigned to a ship bearing our name, and he sent along a picture. With war's end, let us each resolve anew to give, the, to rededicate ourselves, to give the best that is in us, to promote the welfare of these things we love, to work in harmony so that we may feel the world is better because of the deeds we have accomplished. World wars, lost sons. I'm so proud that the DAR was there to support and comfort our nation during those dark, dark days. In the aftermath of the war, we continued our patriotic service work our flag of the United States of America Committee promoted a theme of more flags flying, always properly displayed. In 1958, for example, our members distributed 30,000 flags and 50,000 flag codes. 1,800 programs were provided to outside groups about our flag, and more than 1,000 radio and television announcements aired in support of proper flag protocol. In the California town of Los Gatos, the local DAR chapter undertook a civic project, and not unlike others, staged by daughters from coast to coast. Glennadale Wade was a chapter regent. After watching a nationally televised parade, I wrote to my local newspaper and I asked, where are our American flags? Hmm? Of course, no one answered. And so the Los Gatos chapter decided to do something about it. <laughs> First, we had to survey our merchants to make sure that they wanted to display the flags on the street lamps of our community. But then we need to raise the funds to make it happen. And you know what? Starting as a DAR project, it turned into a town-wide enterprise. The Chamber of Commerce and community organizations and the town council, everybody got involved. A dry, oh my goodness, a dry cleaner even offered free cleaning after every use for the flags. Mm. Isn't that wonderful? So on that November 11th, what a joy to see our veterans parade march down an avenue of American flags. 
reminding all of us that Veterans Day and Memorial Day and the Fourth of July are not just paid holidays, but they are days of commemoration and dedication to America. My, how stirring a sight that must be. My husband would be so proud. And imagine multiplying that sight across the nation. For wherever you find DAR, you find love of country. Your daughters, Mrs. Harrison, have also advocated for an appreciation of American history. In 1968, Congress and President Johnson designated February as American History Month, urging all Americans to learn more about our nation's past. Daughters took that charge seriously. After all, we had sponsored an annual history contest since 1957. The topic in 1968 was an American inventor, and more than 66,000 students participated from nearly 5,000 schools. The eighth grade winner was Leanne Morgan of Greenville, Alabama. I was nervous to enter, but overjoyed to learn that I had won at the state level. Now this, the national first prize in the DAR American History Essay Contest. My teacher and my family are so happy for me, and I owe it all to them and to God for helping me research and write this paper on George Washington Carver. Did you know that he gave us 118 products from the sweet potato and 800 from the peanut? Imagine, as I wrote in my essay, but where in America could a sickly boy born of slave parents rise to unprecedented heights of scientific accomplishment. I believe that it was because of his hard work, initiative, rugged determination, and dedication of high principles of service. These are my goals now. I am sure pleased to take home the 1968 National First Prize, a $50 U.S. savings bond. <laughs> the next few decades were positive ones for the DAR as America celebrated her 200th birthday in style. We sponsored a room at Independence Hall, and we welcomed thousands of new members. The National Society actually led a decade-long celebration that lasted from 1967 to 1977 and culminated in 16,000 state and chapter projects, half of them historical and the remainder classified as conservationist, educational or patriotic in nature. In the state of Indiana, for example, 11 state projects stretched across three administrations and included creation of a bird wildlife habitat sanctuary in the Hoosier National Forest in honor of Indiana daughter Estella O'Byrne, our 20th President General. Well, I was hoping you were going to mention my Indiana daughters. I'm so pleased that they were so marvelously effective. Truly, all daughters rose to this splendid occasion. And here's another example as described by Virginia State Regent Catherine Reynolds Stark. How joyous to be of service during a time of a great national celebration. 120 Virginia chapters completed nearly 500 projects. In addition, we had several statewide projects, including restoration of the garden wall at the old historic custom house at Yorktown. Built in 1721 and operated by our Comte de Grasse chapter, it serves as a focal point for annual celebrations that mark the victory, the American victory, at Yorktown. Virginia daughters were also delighted to provide not one, but two original signatures to the new Americana collection at our national headquarters. The collection includes imprints and manuscripts from colonial America, the American Revolution, and the early days of our new republic. How proud we were to make possible the inclusion of both original signatures of Carter Braxton and Francis Lightfoot Lee, who both signed the Declaration of Independence on behalf 
of our great Commonwealth of Virginia. All along our 125 year journey, there have been thousands of young people whose lives were made infinitely better for having been touched by our daughters. Millions of dollars in scholarships and awards have helped these young Americans reach their full potential. Our DAR schools, now familiar names such as Tomasi and Kate Duncan Smith, were once nothing more than dreams and hopes. Today, together with places like Crossnor, Hillside, and Berry College, they are promoting the highest of educational and ethical standards, all due to DAR's involvement. This support happens in ways large and small, in places far and near. Take, for example, the report from Nancy E. Rouse, who served as state regent of the Rebecca Brian Boone chapter in Fort Thomas, Kentucky in the 1980s. We Kentucky daughters have always had a special place in our heart for the Heinemann Settlement School. You may have heard that they have the first Montessori preschool in the eastern half of the state, and they already have a waiting list. Their program for dyslexic children serves students from five surrounding counties. We never forget the children at the Heinemann School. We make certain that every Christmas, every child has a tree waiting under that, a present waiting under that tree. But you know what? We love all of our schools. We collect box tops, soup labels, and contributions for Tomasi and KDS. We also support nine JAC, Junior American Citizen programs, in our local community. In addition to that, one of our greatest moments last year was awarding a Braille flag for our School for the Blind. It was my distinct pleasure to pin the outstanding ROTC cadet at Northern Kentucky University. You know, we daughters believe, like Mr. Jefferson, that an informed electorate is necessary for the survival of this republic. Mrs. Harrison, please also know that throughout our entire history, our members have continued to collect, transcribe, and share genealogical records. This work together, wills, deeds, family Bible records, cemetery inscriptions, and personal diaries is most often completed by the unsung individual member who selflessly copies and indexes this material so that others may potentially benefit from it while conducting research. Thousands of volumes have been added to our renowned DAR library due to this effort, work completed by patient, painstaking volunteers. Women like, women like Joyce Kerr, who served as state chair of genealogical records for Missouri in the 1990s. We know that Missouri is called the show me state. Well, when it comes to genealogical records, we should be called the show-off state. <laughs> I was recognized in 1998 for compiling 44,079 pages of records during Mrs. Kemper's administration. 44,079 pages? I admit, I like the sound of that. But I was only one of many Missouri daughters working to capture that important information found in those documents. That same year, we received our 27th annual national first place award for submitting the most records. 27th annual, I like the sound of that too. Thousands of records, thousands of hours, all contributed without fanfare, never seeking an award or recognition, just the simple satisfaction that comes from hoping that you might find that critical piece of information needed to help one more woman join our ranks. New members, I like the sound of that best of all. New members. They are the lifeblood of our society, as are engaged members. 
Would all of you who are attending Congress for the first time please rise so that we might welcome you to your home here in our nation's capital. Now we have moved quickly through the decades, highlighting but just a few of the representative examples of what daughters accomplished. And we have arrived at a solemn crossroads of the 21st century. September 11th, 2001, an unforgettable, unimaginable day when the United States was attacked without provocation, resulting in a war on terror that continues to this evening. Daughters responded immediately to assist our nation in thousands of ways adopting the USS John C. Stennis supercarrier, supporting the Lonsdale Regional Medical Center in Germany, providing phone cards, care packages, and countless cards, gifts, and support items to the brave men and women who wear the uniform of our nation. While I had the privilege of serving as a state region of Texas, I had the good fortune to appoint Texas daughter Dottie Wainwright to serve as the chair of our DAR Project Patriot Committee. Dottie's work with our service personnel has been remarkable. Just ask Texas daughter Pamela Marshall. Madam President General, Dottie's devotion has been amazing and so very much appreciated by someone like me, the mother of three deployed sons. Sure, many Texas daughters welcomed home soldiers, supported Fisher houses, staged thank you parties, and comforted the men and women recovering at Brook Army Medical Center. And I know that similar work is completed everywhere we find daughters. But Dottie, well, she calls them my kids, the wounded warriors who need our help the most. She adopts them, whether they need help with housing, medical equipment, supplies, or just a hug. Dottie is devoted to finding ways big and small, to thank these true American heroes. Though health problems kept Dottie from taking part tonight, I assure you that nothing will ever stop her from advocating on behalf of the men and women who serve our nation. Madam President, Madam President General, might we ask those among us this evening who support and serve those in the armed forces and support our veterans to please stand so we might recognize them. I think this is our highest calling as citizens. Might they stand so we may show them our thanks? Please rise if you support our veterans and our troops. Thank you all. Mrs. Harrison, you may recall that Eugenia Washington said, we want a society founded on service. And I'm proud to tell you that in celebration of our 125th anniversary on October 11th, 2015, chapters everywhere participated in the DAR National Day of Service. Thousands of members from coast to coast took part and it was all inspiring to view the photographs and read the highlights of their combined impact. They demonstrated the relevancy and vibrancy of today's DAR, for which this President General will be forever grateful. Here to highlight how DAR members rolled up their sleeves to demonstrate their love of country through service to America on that day is National Celebrate America Chair Leanne Turbeville. Over the past three years, DAR members have answered the call to serve. On the morning of October 11, 2015, DAR members everywhere, across the country as well as overseas, woke up, put on their day of service t-shirts, <laughs> and they gathered themselves together and they got to work. They cleaned and restored historic cemeteries. They prepared meals in soup kitchens and in veterans' homes. They assembled care packages for military members serving abroad. 
They gathered and then distributed much needed items to the underserved members within their own communities. They digitized records in community libraries and historical societies, and they made an impact to those around them. Members from near and far then shared their experiences of that day. Hundreds of emails were sent to DAR headquarters from both chapters and members alike with photos attached of their service projects. And more importantly, those members and others still shared those experiences using the hashtag DAR Day of Service, using social media, which resulted in thousands and thousands of people seeing the impact that DAR made on that day alone. Thank you, Mrs. Young, for allowing me to serve our National Society as the Celebrate American National Chair. It has been amazing, simply amazing, to see our members dedicate millions and millions of hours to service projects in their local community. Millions of hours? I know our founding daughters were committed to focusing their efforts on service activities, but have today's DAR members really created, provided, given millions of hours? Oh, Mrs. Harrison. <laughs> <laughs> you should be so proud of your daughters. Three years ago, at the beginning of this administration, we challenged our members to perform one million hours of service each year in order to celebrate our 125 years of service to America. Well, we never should have underestimated DAR members because they quickly surpassed that aggressive target. Should we see just how many hours of volunteer service our members have provided yes, over the past three years? Yes. Would you please direct your attention to the screen so that together we may witness the total hours that today's daughters amassed in order to demonstrate our purpose and relevancy 125 years after our founding. The three-year total, please. Fourteen million three hundred eighty-three thousand seventy-eight hours. Congratulations, daughters. That is very nearly incredible and so moving. I'm so impressed with all of you. Our founding daughters would be so proud to know that today's DAR members have committed themselves to servicing our country and our nation. Thank you. Mrs. Harrison, nearly one million women have become members of the Daughters of the American Revolution since our founding. They have been driven by the vision that you and our founders set forth and, desire, and the desire for us to preserve and protect the spirit of our revolutionary ancestors. I hope these examples throughout the decades of the work of our members fulfill your call at that very first Continental Congress that we seek for our society to live and grow to greater and better ends. Will you please join me on the lower platform that you may greet and thank just a small representative sampling of the women who have helped our organization thrive for these 125 years.
celebrating 125 years of service to America. Thank you to every member, each a link within a long line of daughters who have loved and served our nation since 1890. God bless America and God bless the DAR. What a wonderful evening. As this fabulous opening night draws to a close, I thank you all for being here as we honor our heritage, focus on the future, and celebrate America. What a special opportunity it has been to commemorate our 125th anniversary of Continental Congress together this evening. One more thing. On behalf of the Indiana Daughters and all of the women who have served throughout the history of this society, I'd like to present you with this orchid. It is my favorite flower. We may need some help with this. I have every confidence in you, Mrs. Harrison. This orchid represents our society as a living thing. Through your visionary leadership, we will continue to grow and flourish over the next 125 years of service to America. We love you and we thank you. And we thank you for your legacy.